relationship with a husband and a wife, that is a reflection of what our relationship should be like from us to God. That relationship is the same. And the reason that's important is this. Because God takes marriage and he wants people who are far from him, who have no idea who he is, to, who, 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 who have not made that God connection yet, although that God connection is naturally in every man and every woman, but who have not made the connection yet. To see a couple, to see a married couple, and say, wow, they have something really special. And recognize that not only do they have something really special, but that special relationship is built, built upon their relationship to God. That is what marriage is to be. It is a living example of Christ on earth. Okay? And so then last week what we talked about is what he must be. Ladies, how many of you liked that talk? Tim gave the talk on what he must be. And that he must be a living example of Jesus Christ. That in a marriage, that the man's role, a woman has a role, a man has a role. And in marriage, the man's role is to be the head of the family just as Christ is the head of the church. And that his role is to be a representative of Christ to his family. Now here's the part that men have to do, that women don't have to do. You see, Jesus' role was this. He was the protector of the church. And, and just as Jesus laid down his life for you and I, for the church, that's the man's role. The man's role is to stand as a living example of Jesus Christ for his family. He leads his, he's a priest, he's a king, and he leads his family with a godly example. And if necessary, he should be willing to die for them. Right? All right. So when I'm 19 years of age, Lene and I first got married. And we got married young. And I didn't know that this principle existed. And in our very first apartment, in our very first apartment, we are laying in our bed, and we hear somebody go to break into our house. We hear, not somebody going to break into our house, we hear them in the living room going through our stuff. She looks over at me and she says, go find out who's out there. <laughs> I'm like, no way. She's like, come on, go find out who's out there. And I'm like, there is no way I'm going out in the living room. That guy could kill me. And she's like, yeah, but if you don't, he could kill us. I'm like, all right, I'm taking my chances. I know, this is true. This is a true story. And she says, yes, but Brian's right next door. You see, women have natural instincts to protect their children. We guys gain those, but they don't come naturally. Oh, you want to eat my children? <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, you want, you want to steal my kids? I'll give them to you. She's like, Brian's next door. You got to go protect him. And, she, and I'm like, well, if you just be quiet, they won't do anything. Let them have whatever they want to. She's like, yeah, but they might take Brian. She gets up, she grabs the baseball bat, she goes out into the living room. <laughs> this is a day I will regret the rest of my life. I did not have a spine then. I have a pretty good one now. And guess what it was? Two cats. And because of that, I will, if it would have been a big man, I could have lived that down maybe. I don't know. But it was two cats. You see, women have this mothering instinct. They have this natural, natural things that, that, that goes on inside them. And so tonight, what we're going to talk about is this. We are going to talk about what does it mean to be a great wife. You see, if you are here and you are a wife, I think this would be a very significant talk. And if you aren't yet. This will be a great talk too. And we're going to do this in two ways. The very first 20-25 minutes, I am going to talk to you ladies. Gentlemen, you get to listen in. I'm going to even reference some things and I'm going to say, gentlemen, pay attention to this. But ladies, the first 20 minutes is yours. Men, do not jab your wife in the ribs as we go through this. 
And then, ladies, at the end of that portion, I'm going to turn and I'm going to talk to the men in this room. And we're going to talk about what a lady must be. You see, because in the church and in America, way too many times we have a very poor image of what a wife must be. That I think America has done a disservice to women. I think America has um, made out women, um, the whole idea of barefoot and pregnant is not far from some people's mentality. And that is shameful. That is absolutely shameful. You see, God did not design marriage as a place for men to oppress women. And if you, and I think this is important too, because many people believe that Christianity promotes oppression to women. That's a big, that's a big theory out there. That's a big thought out there. But I think it's interesting because if you do a comparative religion study, Christianity brings the most amount of freedom to ever, than any other major religion. That Christianity, let, we do not live in a society where ladies have to run around in veils, right? We do not have, uh, live in a society where ladies can't vote, where ladies um, don't have a voice. Christianity does not only bring freedom as Christians, Christianity brings freedom to marriage, it brings freedom to men, it bring, bring, brings freedom to women. So we're going to start where I left off two weeks ago, and that's back in Genesis chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Genesis chapter 2, 18 through 24. And we're going to run through this very quickly. It says this. Genesis chapter 2, 18 through 24. It says, Then the Lord... God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper. I want you to real quick underline the word helper. All right? If, if you have your Bibles, underline the word helper. If you do not have your Bibles, you need to write the word helper on your notes. This is significant. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper. Who is like him? So the Lord God formed out of the ground each wild animal and each bird. And we talked about that last week. Of this guy, and he brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found who was like him. So get this, okay, catch this picture. I'm going to pause for just a second. So Adam is naming all the animals. He's seeing, remember, he's seeing that all the animals have a mate. All the animals have a mate. All the animals have a mate, except him. And this creates this lonely, lonely, lonely desire in his heart. And if you've been alive and you've made it past the third grade, there has been a time that's come in your life where it's like you saw all of your friends with a boyfriend or you saw all your friends with a girlfriend and you went, I want one of those. I only buy one if I can. And there's this loneliness that was in your heart and, and, and be, because there was no one like him. And what he was really saying was he saw these animals, they had mates, but there was no one like him. You see, when you look for a companion, what do you look for? You look for someone who's like you, right? I mean, you're hanging out with somebody and you're like, hey, you make a joke and they laugh. And you're like, hey, they think I'm funny. That's why my wife married me, because I'm funny. You know, and you're, you're doing something cool, and all of a sudden, they do something cool, and you're like, hey, they're like me. They're like me. And so every man and every woman has this natural desire inside them to find someone who is like them. And Adam had the same thing. The man gave the names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found who was like him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs, and he closed the flesh at the place, at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib. He had taken from the man, and he made it into the woman, and he brought her to the man, and he said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman. For she was taken from man. And you see, so right off the bat, 
Adam is made from dirt, and guys still like dirt. <laughs> right? I mean, every sport that guys play has to do with dirt. We like dirt. And women, they were made from plastic surgery. <laughs> right? Right off the bat. Which tells you one thing. Ladies, you have an excuse for why you're high maintenance. God made you that way. God made you high maintenance. He didn't make you out of dirt. He made you out of special material. You see, just, just as like every time my wife spends my money, it is like taking a bone out of my body. It's high maintenance stuff. You were made that way. And then he said, this is why a man leaves his father and mother. And I want you to pause here. Guys, I'm going to talk to you for just a second. Because this is very interesting. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife. You want to notice something really, really super special right here? This, this is interesting. It does not say this is why a man and a woman leave their fathers and mothers and bond to each other. You see, ladies, there's a struggle that happens to you. You see, the guy, when he gets married, he cuts the strings, and he runs off, and he's got his own family, and he sits back and says, ha, I got my own family. Those are my kids. That's my woman. <laughs> it is good. <laughs> but you see, the wife, the woman, she calls up her dad and says, hey, dad, we're thinking about buying a car. What kind of car should we buy? And then when he comes home, she says, hey, I talked to my dad, and my dad said we should buy a Ford, because my dad's smart, and he wants to kill her. You see, when the guy screws up, he sits back, and he goes, he goes, oh, good. Nobody knows about it but my wife. But when the guy screws up, he comes home, he says, yeah, I called my mom and told her what you did. She said that was really stupid. Women have a problem breaking the tie strings to their family. Ladies, you need to hear me. That's destructive. There's a lot of things that will ruin a marriage. That's one of them. There's a lot of things that cause friction in a household. The inability to break pers uh, those, those strings to mom and dad can be destructive. Now listen, this is also important, gentlemen. The fact that you would make your wife do that goes against her very nature. She was created as a nurturer, as a family. She stays very tight to that. But ladies, you need to be very careful with that, okay? That's a freebie. All right. So real quick, I want to wrap this up. So here's what happened, okay? In the Garden of Eden, God created man. And man's life was absolutely incomplete without his wife, without his woman. And so very, the very first thing that you need to recognize is that women complete men. Men, you cannot go through life by yourself. You cannot isolate yourself. Women complete men. I don't know if you know this or not, because a lot of times in a marriage, you get married and you're all excited and your life's going to be happy and hooray, and then pretty soon he begins to float away. And you wonder, what happened? He does not want to float away. He does not want to fish more than he wants to be with his wife. He does not want to work on cars more than he wants to be with his wife. Men are not complete without a lady. The second thing that happened in this was this. Was that when God created Adam, he didn't create women as a subservient. He did not create women as less. Women and men are equal in a marriage, but they definitely have different roles. And then there's the third thing that happened. Women have always struggled with their role. Do you realize that? Women have always struggled with that role. If you go to Genesis chapter 3, the thing that you see is this. That Adam is pretty content with his role. God is content with his role. And Eve gets drawn in by Satan by saying, you're not complete. There's a better way. And so all of a sudden, she begins to look for something else to make her complete because she doesn't want to be that subservient woman. And women were never intended to be subservient. 
But one of the roles of a wife that comes through, and we're going to talk about that in depth, is that a servanthood role for a woman is natural because they are a reflection of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes as a servant. You see, and when you do not get your role correct, when you do not get your role, when you do not, when you do not, um, when you get outside of the intention of the role that God created for a woman, just like when a guy gets outside of the role that, that was intended for him, it brings dysfunction into a relationship. And for Eve, she lost intimacy with God. She found herself in a broken marriage. And she found herself with a loss of self-identity. You see, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper. The word helper is a Hebrew word in this sentence. It's a Hebrew word. And it is azer. E-Z-E-R. And it literally translates, The one who supplies that which is lacking. The power to accomplish a task. So get the picture. Both men and women are a reflection of God. Men and women, men reflect the character of Christ, but ladies reflect the character of the Holy Spirit. You see, his reflection is Christ. Her reflection is the Holy Spirit. That's her natural reflection. You see, every woman was designed first to be a helper. Make a note, write that down. To be a helper, John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. That's John 16, 7. And the very same word in John 16, 7 for helper, which is described in the Holy Spirit, is the exact same word in Genesis chapter 2, which describes the woman's role as the helper. The Greek word is synergos which means co-laborer, companion, the one who is called to come alongside. You see, a man was designed to have a helper, to have a helpmate, to have um, support, to have someone to spend time with. Women make men better. You see, the secret to marriage is women make men better, and the secret to having a strong marriage is the wife comes alongside that man to help him. Do you know that most men are very insecure? Most men are very insecure. Most men are, are, have, have kind of that struggle going forward. But if they have a helper, if they have a companion, if they have someone who comes alongside and says, you can do it, they step up and they, I can. And that's right. You can do it. You can do it. They go, yep, I'm going to take care of my wife. And they just need a helper. One of my, a speaker that I love to listen to is this, is this lady, and, and one of the things that she, talked to, she talks about is that, that her and her husband's marriage was struggling. And I don't know if you've ever been in a struggling marriage, but every marriage goes through it, and there is nothing worse when your marriage is struggling because the future is so uncertain. Her husband comes home, and they had gone past the stage of, you know, that she'd meet him at the door and, and give him hugs and kisses, that usually when he came home, she stayed doing what she was doing, and he went off and did something else. And one day, God really convicted her about her relationship with him. And she said, well, what do you want me to do about it? He said, watch your little girl. They had a little three-year-old girl. So she sat back, sat on the couch, knew her husband was going to come home. He walked to the door, and his little girl ran to the door and threw his arms around her legs. And he goes, oh, I'm not doing that. (laughs) That is not going to happen. And he threw her up in the air and he said, I'm going to take her with me and we're going to, we're going to go outside and we're going to work on the lawn. She said, well, why don't you take me with you? He said, well, if you want to come, you can. She said, I ain't going. So she went to the window and she started watching her little girl and her little girl just walked around just, just at the feet of her father, just hanging around. And every now and then he'd hang out and they'd hold each other. She, she became jealous of her own daughter. because She went, that's the relationship I want. And pretty soon she went, okay, I know how to get my man back. She began to love him that way, that when, she, when he walked to the door, what can I do to help you? How can I help you? How can I encourage you? You see, I can tell you as a man, my number one goal, I don't want to be with my buddies. I mean, I like hanging out with my buddies. I have buddies that I go out and do things with, and I love being with my buddies. 
but I married my wife because I like being with my wife. She's my helper. She's my companion. You see, fishing's great, but fishing does not replace what God intended my marriage to have in it. And that's a companionship. That's a relationship. He chooses you because he loves you, because there's companionship. He says, you are bone of my bone. You are flesh of my flesh. You see, the second thing that the Holy Spirit, the second personality trait that the Holy Spirit has is this. And it is a natural personality trait for ladies. Comforter. John 14, 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. That word helper in this sentence is the same word as comforter. It's the same word as comforter, counselor. I will give you someone who will comfort you. Have you ever been around guys when one of them falls and hurts themselves? What happens? Everybody just goes, oh, oh, that looked like it hurt. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) Oh, I would hate to be him, but that was funny. When you're around the boys, boys don't give each other comfort. Boys don't hang over and say, hey, can I help you out? Let me give you a hand up. Can I make you some soup? It doesn't happen, man. You see, one of those natural roles that the Holy Spirit represents is the comforter. How many of you guys have ever just needed God's presence in your life? The comforter. That, that like, when guys are sick, guys become the biggest babies in the world. Oh, can you help me out? I need some soup. Because guys need to be comforted. You see, that is, that, that is, that's a gift of the Spirit. That's a gift from God. The definition for comforter, you know what it means? You know what the literal definition for comforter means? One who pleads another's case. You see, men need a lady who will stand with them and plead his case. Need, men need a, a lady who will stand with him and will plead his case before your parents, before people who choose to talk bad about him, that he just needs somebody who's going to stand beside him, who's going to comfort him, who's going to be with him through thick and thin, who plead with him before God. Years ago, I had this job that I, I just hated. Did you ever have a job that you hated? Had a job I hated. And going to work was absolutely painful for me. And my wife did something with my mother that changed my life. They secretly made a pact to pray for me every day, all day long while I was at work. And they'd just pray for me, and they'd just pray for me. And then they'd drop these hints that I didn't even know was going on. They'd say, hey, how, how's, how's your job going? I thought that was an average question because that's what guys do. Hey, how's your job? Oh, job's great. I'm like, job's great. But at that time it was, no, the job's terrible. And pretty soon they kept pleading before God. God, would you take care of Paul? God, would you protect Paul? God, would you be with Paul? God, would you change his circumstances? And pretty soon God began to move on my behalf in my workplace. And I began to be able to come home and I began to be happier. And I began to be um, just, just generally just coming back from home and I didn't hate my job anymore. And my wife's going, hey, what's going on at work? Oh, nothing. All of a sudden, my boss likes me. And she says, you know why? Because I've been praying for you. I've been pleading your case. I've been your comforter. I've been with you when, when you're at work. I'm at home, and I'm, I'm pleading for you. You see, that's the role of a wife, to plead his case before God and before people and to stand beside him. A man needs a comforter. He needs an encourager. The third role of a wife is this. It's the role of counselor. Ladies, God has given you a sixth sense of intuition that goes a long ways. Gentlemen, 
Women have the ability to know things about people and to know things about circumstances that you and I will never get. All right, gentlemen, you should say amen. It's just true. And so when your wife comes to you and says, you need to be careful in that situation, you heed that. Because just like the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you're in a situation in your life, and God comes to you, His Spirit comes to you, and it speaks, and it says, don't do that. You ever had that happen to you? Don't do that. Because the Holy Spirit knows what's going on in your life, because the Holy Spirit also has that ability to know what's going on, to say, hey, don't go here. And you know what? I have never, this is personally for me, I have never had the Holy Spirit say, don't do that. I mean, sometimes I feel like God will scream and say, don't do that. But God's Spirit is sweet and soft. And it says, don't do that. It, it, it's that sense where you're like, man, I probably shouldn't do that. You go, man, I really can't figure it out because guys are slow, right? I mean, guys are like puppies. You're like, Oh, you're so cute. Oh, you're so... Really, 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 that's great. You know what I'm saying? And, and guy, guys, are, guys, are, guys have that mentality, you know, going like, okay, God, I think that's you. But ladies have this sense about them. And so when they speak, gentlemen, pay attention to that. John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. One of the roles of a wife is to guide her husband to give him wisdom. Now, here's the danger. We're going to talk about this danger in just a second. Ladies, because you're so smart, sometimes you think he's an idiot. Come on, you can laugh. That's true. Sometimes you're giving your husband suggestions, and he's not taking them. You're like, all right, you are killing me. You are so stupid. And you begin to treat him with ignorance and contempt. That kills him. That makes him struggle. That's damaging to your marriage. You're the counselor. You see things. You notice things. But he's the head. He, he's Christ. He's the one who would die for you. And on a pause, on just a note on that. You see, when a man is not willing to die for his wife, it leaves her feeling insecure. And a woman will always seek security. Because that's their weakness, is insecurity. Their weakness is insecurity. And if the man will not defend his wife, if the man will not stand for his wife, if the man will not be the prophet, the king, the Christ of his household, she begins to look for places to be security, secure because what she can't stand is to be insecure. But women, ladies, when you show contempt towards your husband, it makes him flee, not fight. He flees the relationship. He flees the relationship emotionally. He flees the relationship with his physical body. He goes fishing. He goes and hangs with his buddies. And you wonder what's going on. The fourth thing that I want you to write down is this. The fourth characteristic of the Holy Spirit is the convictor. The convictor. Not the condemnation. The convictor. Because the Holy Spirit has the ability to tell you things that are going wrong in your life without making you feel like a dirtbag. Right? If you have made a commitment to Christ, if you have crossed the line of faith, if at some point in your life you came and you said, Lord God, I recognize you as God and I need you, then here's what happened. The Holy Spirit came into your life, revealed the sin in your life, and did so in such a way that you did not feel um, condemned, but you recognized the need for his help. You see, here's the role for the ladies. You come in. You have insight into what goes on into his life. You have insight into what goes on into your family. And you speak that in such a way that he does not feel condemned, but he feels the love that comes from God, from you. And pretty soon he begins to change his way. He begins to change his course. I'm always amazed 
you'll take these little tiny ladies that are five foot five, and you'll take this guy that's six foot six and 280 pounds, and she will stand toe to toe with him without any intimidation. Right? And she'll be like, you have got to change your ways. You can't do that no more. There will be no more coming home at 2 o'clock in the morning and not calling me and telling me where I'm at. I mean, he, if, if that was anybody else saying that, he'd be like, whack. He's like, okay, okay. I'm so sorry. Did I hurt you? No, you didn't hurt me. You're a dog. I'm a cat. Cats aren't afraid of anything. You know, but all of a sudden, the lady's role comes and says, hey, listen, you can't do that anymore. You see, guys have the ability to do stupid, 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 stupid things. And be like, hey, yeah, that's, that sounds great. And the lady's role comes back and says, don't do that. That'll ruin your life. The last thing of a woman's role is this. The last characteristic of the Holy Spirit's role is the connector. The Holy Spirit is always connecting us to God. Sometimes, ladies, you feel this real struggle in your house because your husband will not connect to Christ. I won't even ask you to put up a show of hands, but I'm telling you, out of any of the things that I deal with in marriages, it seems like I deal with this more and more and more, where the man is not the head of the household. He is not leading his family towards Christ. And the woman feels like then she's going to take on that role and she's going to force him to love Jesus, by God. That's what she does. Because she sees the value of Christianity. She sees the value of Christ in her home. And, if, and what do I do, Paul, if my husband will not lead us towards Christ? Then I've got to take on the mantle. You take on that mantle, and you have stolen that from your husband. He will not connect with Christ. Ladies, don't ever steal his mantle. It's not yours to steal. You're the Holy Spirit. You speak to him. You love him. You, 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 you connect him to Christ through love, through grace, through forgiveness. You see, women have this natural um, ability not just to connect to God, but they have this ability to, to connect fathers to children. You see, a man comes home and he wants to read the newspaper and she comes in and she says, hey, you know what? You should go spend time with Brian. He's been out on the side in the backyard all by himself all day long. And he would love to have his daddy to play with. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I don't know why I didn't think of it. That's because you're a man. All you were thinking about was reading that newspaper. Women have this ability to connect to, like, everybody. Peggy Adams, who's our children's pastor. Man, you go to talk to Peggy, and you say, hey, Peggy, do you know such and such? And she says, oh, yeah, and I know his wife, and, and I know their dog's name, and, and I know their kids' names, and I know their addresses. Because ladies have this ability to throw parties and to connect people to people. And you see, when we connect to people as a marriage, we become a living example of God. Ladies have the ability to try and connect you with your feelings. You get in a fight, and they say, how'd that make you feel? What do you mean, how'd that make me feel? That made me feel angry. Oh, yeah, well, why do you feel angry? Because ladies are emotional. Ladies deal on the emotional side, which takes us to a whole other subject that we're going to spend just a couple seconds on. That's the sexual side. You see, because not only do ladies connect you to God, and not only do ladies connect you to people, but as a marriage... You connect sexually. You see, and here's the deal. Sex is a need for men. Like, no, duh. <laughs> Guys need sex. There's this thing inside them that's like, oh, sex. Women don't need sex. It's a gift for them. When they give sex, I'm not saying that they don't like sex. Don't say I didn't say that, okay? Like, oh, we're in church. We're going to talk about that? Come on. But when women give sex, 
It's a gift. They give it as a gift. For guys, it's just a need. You see, you know, guys run around naked and they think, huh, I'm running around naked, she'll like that. <laughs> right? And ladies are thinking, would you put your clothes back on? <laughs> you are disgusting. <laughs> See, guys think that ladies are going to like that because that's what they like. Because for them, it's a need. Gentlemen, pay attention to me. If you want to make your wife hot, you guys okay with this? Turn her on emotionally. Turn her on emotionally. Be concerned with the woman she is. Be concerned with her day. Be concerned with her life. Be concerned with her heart. Be concerned with her emotionally. Connect to her feelings. Care about what's going on in the inside. Do you know why? Because ladies internally are insecure. They want to be made secure. They want to know that you care about them. They want to know that you are in love with who they are on the inside. You see, way too much stuff for ladies is put on on their physical appearance. It's this, it's this false image that they know they can't live up to. And so if all you are interested in is their external you will lose them internally. You will never make a connection. But women were made to make a connection with. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, and I want you to catch this, and the last thing I have to say to the ladies, and I'm going to spend three minutes on the men. You see, when women, what he must look for is this. Women must, look for, um, women must look for men who embody the characteristics of Christ, and men must look for women who embody the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. But ladies, pay attention to me. You see, if, if you don't commit in, and give your life fully to the Holy Spirit, if you do not make a commitment to Christ, and you keep the Holy Spirit at bay in your life, then instead of being a helper, you become an adversary. And in instead of being a comforter, you become a backstabber. You talk about your husband. You backbite him. You talk about his shortcomings to your friends. You talk about his shortcomings to your mom, to your dad. And when he comes home, he can't live in that household, so he flees. And instead of being a counselor, you're critical. You see, if you, if you watch your characteristics in your home, and you find yourself being critical that everything he does is not good enough, or you become a nagger, instead of being a convictor, you become a nagger, or instead of being a connector, you become a divider. That you hate the things that he's participating in as far as his buddies and his friends. And so you divide him away from those things. Your marriage is in real trouble. It'll die. So guys, what do you look for in a wife? There's eight things. And this is the most simple This is the most simple part of the whole message. Simply this. You want to know what to look for in a wife? Turn to Galatians 5.22. Because if a woman's role is modeled after that of the Holy Spirit, then she, then she should have the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. She should be filled with love. She should be filled with joy. She should be filled with peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And so when you go to look for a wife, when you go to find a mate, a helper, someone who is like you, she must be like the Holy Spirit. She must be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. And as the worship team comes up, here's what I want to do. 
we're, we're going to do one last song. And as we have talked about what she must be, there's always this thing that says, okay, I know who I am. And sometimes there's a gap between who we are and who we're supposed to be in Christ. Everybody goes through that gap. And so during this last song, if you've recognized that there's a gap in your life, if you've recognized that, you know, that for a lot of ladies, you've been so beaten down by men that there is a critical spirit towards men. There is a um, competitive spirit. There is, is not a, a desire to, to comfort or to, or to care for her, but there's this, there's this spirit that comes on and, and takes those things because of your relationship to men in the past and it creates an unhealthiness in your heart. During this last song, we're just going to worship God, but if there's an area in that part of your life that you need prayer, prayer for, we want you to know that the prayer team is here and after service we're going to be around to pray. But gentlemen, here's what I want you to pray for. I want you to begin to pray for your spouse whether you have one currently or you are looking to have one in the future, that you begin to pray for your spouse and you say, Lord God, that you would make my marriage a marriage that reflects Christ, a marriage that reflects God, that reflects our relationship. And you begin to pray for your wife to have the characteristics of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. All right? Let's worship. Let's worship God.
Bow your head with me and we're going to pray. Father God, that we want to come before you, God.